following is a chapter reading by the Worm Audiobook Project. Please support the original author at parahumans.wordpress.com. Thank you and enjoy. Arc 20, Chapter 4 From the moment Charlotte had sent her text, I'd been bracing myself for the worst-case scenario. I'd resolved the situation with Greg, and I'd had just enough time to let my guard down before things started falling apart for real. A guard stopped me in my tracks before I was three steps out of the office, arresting me mid-stride by setting his hands on my shoulders. I resisted the urge to fight him. I wasn't sure I could, without a weapon, my armor, or powers, and it threatened to make the situation worse. He peered down at me, but I averted my eyes, staring down at the ground so he couldn't get a straight look at my face. No running, kid, he said. He let me go, and I resisted the urge to breathe a sigh of relief. My thoughts were a mess, a jumble of half-finished thoughts, ten times worse than it had been earlier in the day. Somehow, in the midst of it, I managed to establish a few priorities. Slip out, get rid of evidence, assess the threat, and then address it. I walked slower. I had the papers I'd removed from the clipboard, and I started tearing them up as soon as the guard had disappeared through the doors of the office. On a more strategic level, I drew on a share of the handful of bugs in the school to get a sense of my surroundings. I'd be letting people know Skitter was present, if they noticed the odd movements of the flies and ants, but I had good reason to believe someone already knew. Either the people after me were the good guys, and it didn't matter if I clued them in, or it was one of my other enemies, and the heroes showing up could be a good thing. Arcadia High consisted of two longer buildings joined by a third, joining them to form something like a capital H. The main office, where I was, and all the other administrative and staff-related facilities seemed to be located around the center. The only exits from this immediate area would open into an open space where I would be surrounded by walls lined with windows, all looking down at me. Worse, the doors all had heavy horizontal bars that suggested they were emergency exits, and an alarm would sound if I used them. Assuming I had someone after me, I couldn't afford to put myself in that position. That left me two options. I could head into the building to my left, which featured four stories of classrooms, the cafeteria, and a gymnasium, with a door that led to the student parking lot at the front of the school, or I could head to the right, into a building that was much the same, though longer, with an auditorium and the front doors of the school in close proximity to one another, and quite a few more classrooms. I headed for the front door, to my right, depositing the scraps of paper in a trash can on my way. I moved as fast as I could without drawing undue attention, discreetly placing bugs on all the guards I could find. I stopped in my tracks as my bugs made contact with two other individuals. Adamant and Seer were in the company of two guards, moving from the front door to the intersection immediately in front of me. Making a sharp right, I headed for the stairwell, ducking away before they could advance far enough ahead to get a glimpse of me. I'd worried they were making a beeline straight for me, but they stopped at the junction where the two hallways met. I was already reaching the hallway below. The guidance counselor's office and staff meeting rooms sat behind floor-to-ceiling windows with the same glass that the exterior windows had. Hexagon-shaped cells blending near seamlessly into one another. Looking straight out it, I couldn't tell the difference, but the light caught each cell differently, if I viewed them at certain angles, making them stand out. Measures against Shatterbird? Behind one of the windows, I could see two guidance counselors sitting in a circle with a dozen students. Nobody, not even the guard who was standing on the other side of the glass door, gave me more than a glance. The exterior windows of the building were all securely closed. The building was cool despite being a greenhouse of sorts, but it made getting my bugs into the building a difficult matter, and that left me with a relatively small swarm. I gauged the number of bugs I could spare, and situated less mobile bugs on doors and at the points where the walls met the floor or the ceiling. I might have preferred a denser collection to map out my surroundings, but it gave me a sketchy mental picture of how the hallways were laid out. A small cloud of flies was the only now reaching the front office, 
slipping inside as a student opened the door, navigating between legs and feet to make their way to the principal's office. Listening in required conscious thought, but I'd been working on training my brain to follow human speech with the insect's alien hearing. It was easier, the more I had nearby, but I'd have to make do. Fight on my campus, she spoke into the phone. I had some information for now, for as long as she was on the phone. Not much, and it required me to divert some focus to translating, but it was something. Of my students are at least sensitive to them feel unsafe. It was an unfamiliar school, and while I had a basic sense of the layout, particularly on the exterior, the interior was something of a hurdle. The hallway I was on ended in short staircases at either end, each of which led up to the main hallways of larger buildings. I had to make my way towards one of the furthest from Seer and Adamant. If that's in order... Yes. Fine. The principal hung up the phone, placing it on her desk. She didn't act right away. I quickened my pace. The bugs I had on her pant legs informed me she was swiveling around. I had to think of the layout of her office before it clicked. The computer. I was at the top of the stairs, the door that led to the parking lot at my left, when the signal went through. Every single guard in the building reacted in the same moment, as did Adamant and Seer. Some withdrew things from their pockets, phones, I could guess, while others were already kicking into action. It wasn't just the guards. The bugs I had on classroom doors informed me of some students slipping out of class. Two students, both boys. My enemy was the Protectorate, or someone with strong connections in the Protectorate. Nobody else would be able to pull this. Guards stepped into the building and shut doors behind them. The heavy mechanical sound of the doors locking echoed down the hall around me. The doors leading outside were all being sealed shut. The gate at the front end of the school was closed, and a guard was heading for the chain link barrier at the edge of the parking lot as well. Could I run? Maybe. Fight my way past the guards? It was possible. I could cloak myself in bugs, use my limited repertoire to disguise myself, to disable and or distract them while fighting my way outside. I could get to the end of the parking lot in time? That too wasn't impossible. Altogether, with barely a hundred bugs available? I wasn't so sure. Any fight took time, it involved a risk to myself, and I wasn't wearing my costume. If any of the guards had a weapon they'd confiscated, or if one of the capes in the area caught up with me, I'd be more than screwed. I didn't have any bugs on my person. I'd been concerned about a pat-down at the gate, and I didn't want to have bugs crawling throughout the insides of my pants legs or my pockets when a guard searched me for weapons. I wasn't wearing my costume for much the same reason. Stupid of me. I was stuck. May I have your attention, please? Principal Howell's voice sounded from the speakers throughout the school. The school is now being locked down. For your own safety, please remain in your classrooms. Students not in an assigned classroom should proceed in a calm and orderly fashion to the nearest seating area. Students in the north wing of the school will need to make their way to the auditorium. Students in the south wing should gather in the cafeteria. Remain calm and rest assured there is no immediate danger. The news was constricting around me. Students would be contained in select areas, and classrooms would be cleared one by one. If the protectorate was involved, I wasn't even sure I would be able to find a proper hiding spot. Didn't Kid Wynn have some ability to see through walls or detect heat signatures with his goggles? The two boys had been reaching a room on the bottom floor, near the gymnasium, and were quickly changing into their costumes. Clock Blocker and Kid Wynn. What did the good guys know? They'd been alerted that I was in the school. I'd been in the office only minutes ago, and the principal had put my name into the computer. That was probably the catalyst, given how fast things had proceeded in the minutes since. The principal got the phone call, had ordered the lockdown as a consequence. The fact that she'd warned me, it didn't jibe with the lockdown. She probably hadn't wanted to do it. It struck me that they didn't know that I was in the school now. Inside of the building, I was largely defenseless. Outside, I did have my bugs. I doubted I could get out without drawing attention, but I could theoretically get them to call off the lockdown. 
My bugs moved from the surrounding blocks and collected near one of the fire doors I'd noted earlier. They formed into a decoy, a rough copy of my general silhouette, covered in bugs. I then began moving toward the school gates. One of the guards standing by the auditorium saw and shouted for Seer. The white shrouded hero hurried for the door. Seer was a long range cape, probably capable of killing my swarm with the little difficulty. I split my swarm off into further copies, maintaining their movement toward the gate and the walls. Another announcement was broadcast throughout the school. A supervillain is currently near the school entrance. Students in the central areas of the school should relocate to the cafeteria. Anyone already in a secure place should please remain where they are. The office was emptying now, and guards were breaking away from their groups to ensure that every student that had been sitting around in the hallways was moving to the appropriate areas. Emma was among the 40 or 50 students heading toward the cafeteria, nestled in the midst of the group, while the principal followed at the rear with two guards in her company. Behind me, the guidance office was evacuating as well. The glass door opened, and the soundproof seal broke. I could hear one of the counselors speaking to the twelve or so teenagers around him. Let's go to the cafeteria. If this takes a while, we'll at least be able to eat. He spotted me and gestured for me to join the group. I could have argued and asked to go to the auditorium instead. There were any number of excuses that could have worked, including, I have an issue with one of the students who is in the cafeteria. But I was more interested in being invisible. Better to play along, to think of a plan and execute it, while doing as little as possible to draw attention to myself. Here, at least, I'd be hidden among others. I joined the crowd moving in the direction of the cafeteria. More guards were directing other students to the cafeteria. The groups merging into a single mass, with the cafeteria doors at the bottleneck. Inside, everyone was spreading out to find tables. Again, I noticed the distinction between the two varieties of student. The bright and cheerful ones were collecting together, filling up every space at the tables closest to the door and the front of the cafeteria where all the food was available. Others were spreading out, alone or in groups of two to five. The principal and other staff members were standing by the door, seeing that everyone filed peacefully into the room. Emma was sitting at one table with all of the secretaries and a few of the teachers who I'm supposed hadn't had a class to teach. She glared at me as I walked into the room. I found Charlotte, too, identifying her by the cube of paper with the ladybug inside that I had my more prominent minions carrying these days. Taylor, she hissed, as I made my way toward the table at the back of the room. I was dimly aware of Seer striking down one of my decoys. The moisture in the air zipped to his hand, and a near half of the decoy was ruined, the bugs dazed or unable to move. The spiders, I noticed, suffered worse than most. They used a kind of biological hydraulic system to move. Shit, I liked my spiders. They were particularly useful. I reached Charlotte and mummered. Best if you don't know me. Hey, Taylor, she hissed the words, twisting around in her seat. When I didn't reply, she repeated herself. Hey, is this about you? I think so, I mummered. I took a seat at the table near the back folding my arms in front of me and resting my chin on the back of my hands, staying out of sight while keeping an eye on everything. It also allowed me to focus on my swarm. My bugs were discreetly tracing back routes and other options. Was there a place where the cafeteria staff unloaded the day's food? Some back way leading from, say, a gym or a custodial entrance? A way to the roof, even? I didn't have enough bugs to spare that I could leave them on walls. I was forced to personally memorize every corridor and feature of the building that might be important. Outside, Seer was working at destroying my decoys. I split off more copies, and then moved one group to him to see if I could blind him. The bugs were being sucked dry of moisture as they got too close to Seer. I wouldn't be able to disable him with just my swarm. He drew more water from a cloud of bugs, desiccating and killing hundreds. The number that died was in indicative of something, though. As devastating as the attack was, the effect didn't cover a massive area. It was roughly cone-shaped area, with a long reach but a narrow breadth. If he was surrounded by moisture, maybe I could use that against him. My flying bugs started doing bombing runs. 
They picked up small stones and dirt, using the fine tarsals that helped them cling to walls. There wasn't the suction, but it served to allow them to pick up specks at a time. They flew in tight loops, staying high over Seer as they dropped the fragments, touched ground to collect more dirt, then repeated the process. I was careful to spread them out and collect the fragments from multiple places so he didn't kill too many at a time. Dense moisture and dirt could become a thin mud, and it might serve to blind him or distract him where my bugs couldn't. In the cafeteria, another group of students was filing inside, fifty or sixty in all. They each bore telltale signs of the kids who'd stayed. Many were drenched in sweat, and the teacher with them had a basketball. Had they been in the gym, burning off nervous energy, working on building social bonds and all that? There were maybe three or four hundred people in the cafeteria now, as students from all over the school streamed in, including most of the ones from the auditorium. With the increasing numbers of students, it was impossible for anyone to have a table to themselves. A group of three boys claimed the far end of Charlotte's table, and she stood up. She had issues around unfamiliar men. It might have served as a push for her to do what she'd been debating doing anyways. She joined me at my table, sitting close enough that our shoulders touched. What's going on? She whispered. You know when Tattletail vetted everybody? I whispered back. Charlotte nodded. She made a list of names. Some vetted people along with some others who were safe. Mixing it up. She gave the list to the principal, with the idea that maybe she could cut us some slack and we'd be help keep the peace in the school in exchange. So she had an idea that I was related to the Undersiders. She told me to run and hinted someone might be after me, I said. Charlotte nodded again, mute. I tried, I whispered, but I couldn't cover enough ground in time. Someone forced her hand and ordered her to put the school on lockdown. I can't slip out without drawing attention to myself. I'm not in a position to fight, and it's only a matter of time before they find me. Shit, she said. Exactly, I said. I won't blame you if you want to move somewhere else. I'll stay, she said. Shar, I'll stay, she repeated. I relented. I couldn't afford to focus on this when I needed to control my bugs and memorize any potential escape routes or hiding places. If anything happens, get clear. You don't know me. Your little brother is counting on you, and he should be your priority. Little brother? she asked. I saw the realization as she remembered our code word. Little brother referred to all the kids in her care. Oh, right, she said. Kidwin was making a beeline for the front door. I clustered bugs on the surface of the door, blocking his line of sight as much as I was able. It didn't work. The thermal goggles, which means he can tell there's no body inside any of the decoys. He pushed the door open and shouted, Seer! That was about as far as he got before my bugs descended on him, filling his open mouth. What are you going to do? Charlotte asked, with a degree of attention that I was devoted to what was going on. She sounded almost distant. Even with the murmuring of hundreds or so students conversing, the cafeteria was eerily still and quiet compared to what was going on outside. Adamant was standing at the doorway to the auditorium, simultaneously trying to keep an eye on the stray students from the north building and the fighting outside. Clockblocker was making his way to the front. He was slightly different. He wore what seemed to be a gauntlet, out of proportion with the rest of his body. I have a few options, I whispered in response. I could be aggressive, take on the people at the door. I think I could slip away. Why didn't you do that already? They were too guarded, and they were anticipating trouble from within the building. My bugs are causing some chaos outside now, and they'll have their backs turned. I'll have time to improvise a mask, which I didn't before. You'll have to get out of the cafeteria first. I'm not too worried about that, I said. There's two or three possible escape routes I've been able to find. If I can get my hands on a set of keys to create a big enough distraction to get away with making some noise. The principal has my back, and she might make it easier. I'd ask her for a key, but I'm not sure she'd be willing to risk it. And there's too many people around her. Including Emma, I noted. One person I could count on to pay attention to me. What if she's the one who made the call to the people who were after you? The principal? I shook my head. Her priority is keeping this school and its students safe. Besides, I overheard her communicating with someone on the phone. 
If she was playing both sides, there'd be no reason for her to maintain the ruse while I wasn't anywhere nearby. Unless she knew that you could hear through your bugs, Charlotte added. Unless she knows, I echoed her. I don't think she does. Kid Wynn was suffering at the hands of my swarm. He drew a weapon, but my swarm was already prepared with lengths of silk. They constricted the weapon and prevented it from unfolding. Seer, for his part, had his hands full trying to take down the decoys. A large part of what I was concentrating on was the decoys, getting enough details right and splitting them off in a way that suggested I could be in any one of them, while simultaneously keeping them far enough apart that he couldn't attack more than one at once. Taylor, Charlotte whispered, if they know who you are, they know. They could find you again, or put your face on the news. If they did, it would be breaking a good few unwritten rules, especially if they only knew who I was because I helped with the Enchidna situation. They can't afford to punish villains for helping against the big threats. It would mean fewer people showed, and they need all the help they can get. Here, at least, they could say I was intruding on neutral ground. The explanation felt feeble. It doesn't make sense, Charlotte whispered, echoing my line of thinking. Doing it here? At a school? With so many potential hostages around? Breaking the code? I'm thinking, I replied, I'm thinking everyone knows the Protectorate is falling apart. Legend's gone. Adolin's announced he's leaving as soon as things got quieter. The head of the PRT stepped down. A whole bunch of rank-and-file members left. And so did well in a lot of the more monstrous capes. Maybe there's pressure from the top to put one in the win column, remind people why the Protectorate exists. And who better to take down than the creepy teenage supervillain who's leading a team that took over the city? But in a school? I didn't have any guesses to offer on that count. I focused on the fighting outside instead of responding. Getting too close to Seer was killing my bugs just as easily as his long-ranged absorption attack. I had to attack him from range, and the rain of dirt and small stones wasn't doing anything as far as I could tell. I turned to a tack that had crossed my mind when fighting Echidna. She, like Seer, had been tricky to get close to. Unlike Seer, she'd been too big to really tie up. Spiders drew out lines of silk and formed them into cords, weaving them into one another to form extended lines, fifty or so feet long. With the combined efforts of a dozen flying insects, half gripping one end and half gripping the other, the lines were flown in Seer's direction, so he was caught in by the middle. The bugs holding the ends then continued onward, keeping the cord taut as they circled him, one group flying clockwise, the other flying the opposite direction. In this manner, they orbited him, winding him up in a single length of cord. With five cords being wound around him in that fashion, I soon had him hampered, his arms and legs restricted in movement. He kept moving forward, attacking my decoys. As he passed the signpost, I hurried to have my bugs wind the remaining length of cord around it. Lines went taut, cords constricted around him, and he fell. He struggled, but it didn't seem he would be getting to his feet any time soon. With Kid Wynn on the ground, thrashing, that was two down. The other two, I was pretty sure I could deal with if it came down to it. I wasn't sure what Clockblocker's glove did, but I had a suspicion. Adamant's armor was just begging to have silk cords wound through the chain links and armored plates. My bugs rifled through Kid Wynn's pouches and armor compartments. Masses of the bugs and teams of the larger, stronger bugs working to pull silk cords helped to divest him of his various tinker tools and components. His smartphone, a cylinder with a trigger on the front and a button on top, a sphere with a hole in the center with screw-like rifling and electrical connectors in the interior. There were two devices like tuning forks, too, with tines that wound around each other without touching, and wires beneath the handles. Bugs in his ears helped to work an earbud out of position and carry it off. Once he was denied as many of his tools as I could move, I dragged them away. It was only when I was sure that he wouldn't be able to use them against the swarm or against me that I eased up on him. I let my bugs drift in the general direction my decoys had gone, as though I were leaving or gone. He stood, gagging and choking. 
Seer wasn't in sight, and I'd taken Kidwin's phone. There was only one place for him to go if he wanted to communicate with others or touch base. He headed back into the school. I was ready. Bugs flowed out of his pockets, gaps in his armor and from where they'd clustered at the small of his back. I tied his wrist to the door handle. It took him a long few seconds to realize the door wouldn't swing shut until he moved. That brought the remainder of my swarm time to turn around and flow through the open entryway. They headed straight for the guards and swept into their pockets the same way they had with Ken Wynn's pouches. Keys? Yes. While Kid Wynn and the guards were blinded, my bugs fetched the keys. I stood from the bench at the lunch table. I think I'm set. Just like that? Charlotte asked. I looked at the front of the room, where the students were feeling hunger and teenage appetites overcoming their fear of what was going on elsewhere in the school. Only a dozen or so. Maybe they don't have a steady supply of food where they are, I mused. There were areas of town which weren't in a good shape. Their pizza slices, I noted. It was a reminder of how the day wasn't going as I'd planned. It shouldn't be a problem, I said. Get out, then see what Tattletail can manage as far as damage control. Wish me luck. I'll send you a message and meet you at the lair after school if everything goes according to plan. I crossed the cafeteria, heading for the buffet tables and sneeze guard protected counters with empty trays waiting to be filled by staff. Emma was at her table, I noted, surrounded by secretaries and teachers. I was joined by other hungry students, eager for their free food, and their bodies helped to block me from the sight of both Emma and the staff. Confidence, I thought. I stepped around the counter and through the doors that led into the kitchen. Confidence made it look like I knew what I was doing. Being furtive would only arouse suspicion. My bugs were still carrying the keys, bringing them along an air vent. I'd need to find a way to open a vent cover to retrieve them, but it was among the smallest of the problems I'd faced today. I found a door to the outside. My bugs clustered on the other side, my hand pressed against my own, separated by an inch and a half of door. I glanced over my shoulder to make sure I hadn't been followed, then started looking for a way that I could get into the air conditioning duct. The smallest of the problems I'd faced today. There was an impact heavy enough that the lights flickered. Even the bugs I'd gathered on the door were knocked loose, both by the force of the landing and the flying dust and debris. Right outside the door. I didn't need to move my bugs to search out the identity of this antagonist. A figure strode through the swarm of bugs. He tapped the door with the end of his weapon, and the breath was knocked out of me. Every bug within thirty feet of the door died including the ones in the air conditioning duct. I was still reeling as he pushed against the door. It was dead bolted, but the metal of the door's surface buckled and it tore free of the frame. He was wearing armor, forest green and gold, with the stylings of a lizard's frills or bat wings on the trim, and a faint etching of scales to the green portions. His spear, too, bore a distinctive design, with an etching like a lizard's skull worked into the heavy spearhead. He advanced, his spear point leveled at my chest, and I backed up, maintaining a distance between us. To do otherwise would mean letting him drive the weapon into my chest. On the other side of the campus, another heavy armored suit touched ground, somewhat more gently. He stopped when we were at the front of the cafeteria. I kept backing up, knowing it was futile. Dragon had exited the other suit, and was using a jetpack to navigate the hallway, flying towards us with an accuracy and ease of movement that belied how fast she was moving. I didn't have an escape route. The woman stopped directly behind me, at the entrance of the cafeteria. Dragon, I said. An armsmaster. The name is Defiant, armsmaster corrected me. His voice had a funny sound to it. Skitter, Dragon answered me, loud enough for everyone to hear. Her voice was almost gentle. I'm sorry it worked out this way. My hand was forced. Hi, this is Ronku. You just finished listening to a chapter from Arc 20, Chrysalis, from the web serial Worm by J.C. McRae. 
This production is brought to you by the Worm Audiobook Project. If you'd like to know more about us, or to volunteer your own services, please check us out at audioworm.rein-online.org. You can download or listen to every chapter directly from our site, or you can find us on iTunes or any podcast app under Worm Audiobook. Thank you for listening.